All right, we are going to try this again. And see if we can get this working. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay, we're gonna try to. Okay, can you guys hear me? I can hear you, and it's not you echoing. Can? Yeah, and it's not echoing for me. We got it. We got it. I'm so excited. <gasps> Yay! Wait, is it echoing for people who are watching? I don't think we it is. I feel like things... Yeah, yeehaw sounds like we're good to go. Okay, look at us. This okay. is so exciting. This just changed the game. It really did. I'm going to start sharing this. Okay. Um, I'll share it to all the other... Um, okay. I'll share it to all the other pages, too. Okay. Before we get started... This is the most exciting thing ever. I know. It's the little things. It really is. I feel like we're like celebrities who have been going live with each other <laughs> on I Instagram know, and have... stuff. <laughs> Everyone yeah, right, is yeah, just how real this is. I know. <laughs> They're like, what a bunch of noobs. <laughs> I know. Can you hear the construction going on outside? Is it really distracting? No, not okay. really. Good. I'll talk over it anyway. Okay. I'm going to be sharing. Oh, hi, Carrie. All right. Are there any other places you Yeah, I'm just going to share it to all the, um, all the other people. Okay. I hope I'm not freezing. I've had really good Wi-Fi all day, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're good. Yay. Hey. Hi, all our friends that are joining. How's everyone's day going while we get all set up here? So if anyone here right. hasn't already seen, we're going to be talking to Hear me okay? Yeah. Um, today we're going to be telling you guys some stories. So Hannah's going to, she's going to be talking. Here. Okay, it was freezing a little bit, so I just turned my Wi-Fi off and switched to data, so I think I should be, I think it should be better okay, for good. me. Good, because I got nervous, because on my computer screen it, it, screen, it said it froze, like it was interrupted, is what it said. Oh, hope it's not. I mean, it's good now. Okay. All right, so I think that I'm ready to get started. Okay, let's let's go for it. And so I'm going to be telling the story of the Stonewall Uprising or the Stonewall Riots or the Stonewall Rebellion. It goes by a lot of different names depending on where you're reading it. 
And before I got into my part, and I'm, I'm also going to be talking about Marsha P. Johnson and the way I did it is I'm going to be kind of talking about her after I go over Stonewall so I can talk about her separately and some of things about her to really focus on that. And I just wanted to um, put a little disclaimer out there that I am a cisgender straight woman, so I am telling this story from an ally's perspective, um, but at least one of the resources that I used came from an LGBTQ plus resource. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm telling this in a respectful way, but I am telling it from outside of the community. So just wanted to put that out there. And I have my notes and I'm going to get started. <laughs> so the sources that I used for this were glad. Um, I used history.com and I used an article from the Washington Post. So, the Stonewall Riots, or the Stonewall Uprising, was a series of riots and protests that lasted for five consecutive nights in June of 1969. Many historians consider it a huge turning point for LGBTQ rights. This year will mark the 51st anniversary of the rebellion. So, what was Stonewall and... Why did the Stonewall Uprising happen? Well, the Stonewall Inn was a bar in Greenwich Village in New York City that was known as a safe haven for the LGBTQ community. During this time, quote-unquote homosexual acts were illegal in every state in the U.S. except Illinois. So bars and restaurants could legally be shut down for having gay employees or serving gay patrons or anyone that was part of the LGBTQ community or even looked in a stereotypical way to be a part of that community. I um, was listening to Elvis Duran the other day and they were talking about how, um, cause uncle Johnny that's on there. He mm -hmm. like lived through that back then on like fire Island down mm -hmm. state. And he was saying that, um, like, if you went to a bar and you even, like, you were dancing with someone of the same gender or, like, you even, like, turned to talk to someone of the same gender, they could accuse you of being homosexual and they could arrest you for that. Mm -hmm. It's insane. Yeah, it was crazy. Literally, discrimination was thriving. It was legal to discriminate against people, um, which is absolutely crazy and something that I really, really wanted to highlight is that when we say this happened in 1969, especially young people, it can sound like, oh, that was so long ago. But like mm -hmm. a, a lot of our parents were born at that time and mm -hmm. it, re it was not that long ago. 51 years ago is not long ago at all when people did not even have the rights to like literally you could be arrested for who you were. It's just insane. Mm -hmm. So we want to just like keep that in the background of all of this. But there was a lot, like, building up to this moment. So, police raids on gay bars were common, and much of the time resulted in the harassment and brutalization of LGBTQ people at the hands of the police. And on the night slash morning of June 28, 1969, at around 2 a.m., when police tried to raid the Stonewall Inn, which they had done many times before, LGBTQ patrons and supporters decided to fight back against the discrimination and brutality, and they refused to comply with police. Oh, hi, Sarah. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the first night of the, um, of the riots ignited the community and allies, and for five more nights, protests persisted. The police continued to push back against the protesters, letting off tear gas and beating members of the crowd the following night. So on night two. It is miraculously reported that no one died or was seriously injured. And that was, like, pretty surprising to me when I read that because I feel like whenever we hear about it, we hear about how violent it was and that it was violent, mm -hmm. but it's pretty incredible that no one died during it. For the next three nights, LGBTQ activists and supporters continued to gather at the Stonewall Inn, and although police continued to show up, it was less confrontational compared to the large-scale riots from the previous nights. But that's not where the Stonewall Uprising ends, because much of the news coverage of the Stonewall Uprising was homophobic at worst, using homophobic slurs against the protesters, and at best, barely gave them any coverage at all. 
the LGBTQ community protested against the Village Voices coverage of the riots in particular. And for people who don't know, the Village Voice is a really popular paper in New York. I don't know if it's still if it's still a paper there, but it was really big I at the time. Think so. I think it is too. I feel like I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know they make a reference to it in um in Rent, but that's a whole other that's a whole <laughs> other thing. Yeah. But um, that was still like early nineties. Yeah. So. Yeah. And this was late. This was sixty nine. So um they protested against the Village Voices coverage of the riots in particular because of their derogatory homophobic language. And I I'm not going to repeat any of this, obviously, right now, but if you look it up, you can see what kind of truly homophobic coverage is being given to this. Um, the Stonewall riots did not start the movement for LGBTQ rights. There was a lot of things happening leading up to the Stonewall uprising. Is that saw really, really loud right now? Okay. No. It's just really loud on my end. Um, I yeah, can so... hear it like a very tiny bit, but okay. I can definitely hear you more. Okay, as long as it's not a disruption so they did not start the movement for lgbtq rights it wasn't like it started anything it's more like there was a lot building up to this moment particularly with the stonewall in and what was going on in new york city at the time and the laws that existed but it is credited with putting the issue on america's political map um the first pride march took place on the one year anniversary of stonewall and is the reason we celebrate Pride Month in June today. So that's kind of where I'm finishing in terms of Stonewall, but we cannot talk about Stonewall without talking about Marsha P. Johnson. Um, and that is the picture that anyone saw. Um, you saw a picture of the protests. You saw a picture of Stonewall in actually um, the day of the uprising. And I meant to write down, but if you zoom in on the picture, you can see a sign that was placed in the window of the bar that um, there's like a sign in, in the window. And I, you have to zoom in to see, I should have written down what it said. But the other picture is Marsha P. Johnson. And she was such a force to be reckoned with. And it's, she's so important to talk about. So Marsha P. Johnson was a black trans woman who dedicated her life to advancing the lives and rights of the LGBTQ community. It is a common misconception that Marsha P. Johnson threw the first stone or brick or uh, shot glass or bottle at Stonewall. It, different stories say it as different things, but it's a misconception that she started it or that she threw anything to start it because she said herself that she was not one of the first to uh, resist, although she was there and she was a part of it, but she was not the first. That's a really big misconception. That's Interesting. I never knew that. Mm -hmm. um, but despite the work that, um, so she did a lot of other work, though, leading up to that. That's not to diminish her impact or anything. She was certainly a huge, huge part of Stonewall and a huge part in of LGBTQ rights in general. Um, but despite the work that she put into fighting for LGBTQ rights, such as Finding Star, which is an activist organization for trans individuals and opening an LGBT youth homeless shelter. It was, I'm pretty sure what I read is that it was the first in the country. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. And she, despite doing that with her fellow trans activists and friends, Sylvia Rivera, much of the cisgender gay community wanted Johnson and Rivera out, shunning them for being trans. Still, Marsha P. Johnson continued her work marching with the AIDS activist group ACT UP, which people may have heard of before, and nursing her friends on their deathbeds throughout the AIDS epidemic. On July 6, 1992, Marsha P. Johnson's body was found in the Hudson River. It was ruled a suicide and after protests was listed as an accidental drowning, but those closest to her and many people today believe she was murdered because she had been brutalized many times before simply for existing as a black trans woman and her case was reopened in 2012 but it remains unsolved and i saw that in 2018 i think it was the new york times published an obituary for her a full obituary because as much as we talk about her now in 2020 and in, in the past um, couple of years she was not recognized for the work she did and she went unnoticed for many 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 years 
So that is sad. And like, mm-hmm. I, honestly, I feel like I didn't really know about Stonewall growing up mm-hmm. until like the last few years. I feel like we've really started to talk about it. Mm-hmm. More. For sure. Me too. I, I don't remember learning about it in school. And yeah, I, I don't think it was until the past couple of years that I knew anything about it. Um, but there was, I did learn a lot about it in a podcast that I'm going to um, talk about at the end of this. Um, okay. So without Marsha P. Johnson, whose P in her name stood for pay it no mind, meaning like, if you don't like what I have to say, like mind your own business. I thought that was amazing. Yeah. The LGBTQ community would not be what it is today. The LGBTQ community has trans women, especially black trans women, to thank for so much of their freedom. And after years of suppressing their significance in the movement, it is important now more than ever to recognize them. So that is the story of the Stonewall Uprising or riots or rebellion and Marsha P. Johnson. But it truly scratches the surface. And I definitely encourage everyone to take June Um, as Pride Month and especially now to really, really research this and to learn Marsha P. Johnson's name and to learn Sylvia Rivera's name, who is also a trans woman, and learn about what they did. So, yeah. What did you say that the podcast was called? Okay, so the podcast is, it's called The Bowery Boys, and it's a, uh it's a New York City history podcast, and I either... Maybe just one of them I know is gay, but I don't know if the other one is. But they have an episode number 231, and it's called The Stonewall Riots Revisited. And I think that it's called that because they do have an earlier episode about Stonewall, but it doesn't go – it's from when they kind of first started the podcast, so it doesn't go as far in depth. And I listened to that – I think it was last – it might have been last June. Like, I think I – during Pride Month, I wanted to know more about this. Um, and I really got into the podcast because I started watching the show Pose, which everyone mm-hmm. should also watch. It it takes place in New York City during, like, ball culture and drag queen culture, and it features trans actors, like, playing trans people. It's amazing. And that podcast, The Bowery Boys, has an episode about ballroom culture as well, and it's really, really excellent. And um, I believe one of them... He was um, something something to do with, like, the 10-year anniversary. One of the anniversaries of Stonewall, they did something really big, and one of the people of the podcast was there and talked about what it was like to experience that and oh, to grow awesome. up in New York City as a gay person. So that was really cool. And then there's also a documentary on Netflix about Marsha P. Johnson's life that I've heard is very excellent and covers her really well. And I haven't watched it yet, but I'm planning on it. That picture that you had sent me, um, it, like, when I was looking up pictures, that was linked to, like, the documentary. Okay. Which I didn't know that was a documentary, so I also brought that down to go watch. Yeah, for sure. So. All right. Okay. That was good. Thanks for listening. I feel like we're Karen and Georgia, for those of you that are also MFM fans. Yes. I'm reliving some fantasies, or I'm living out some fantasies Mm -hmm. right now. Yep. All right. So I am going to be talking um, actually about two cases. And um, they're the two cases that helped, uh, like, paved the way for them to come up with the Hate Crimes Prevention Act, which I will talk about a little bit at the end. Um, But I have talked about it during trivia before. Um, Alexander said awesome job, by the way. Thanks, Alexander. Um, I will talk about that a little bit at the end, but I have talked about it during trivia before. Um, it is something that they signed that makes, um, if someone commits uh, a crime against another person based on, like, their, their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, um, that's then considered a hate crime, which can lead to federal charges. So, the first case I'm going to be talking about, I think, is definitely a lot more known, and that's the case of Matthew Shepard. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So I'm not going to go over all the details, um, but you can get a lot of information from matthewshopper.org, which is where I got some information. I also use good old Wikipedia, because that's just who I am. Yeah. And then um, there are a ton of great movies about this. I remember watching a movie in sociology class when I was younger, um, and it's called Ma- Matthew Shepard is a friend of mine. I saw, so I've seen that movie. as well. Mm-hmm. Trigger yep. warning, it's, it's pretty emotional. Yes. I, um, it was an emotional watch. Both of these stories are kind of emotional, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah. okay. So but they're important. First I'm gonna, yes, exactly. So to begin with, I'm going to start with some information about Matthew, or he also likes to be called Matt. He was born December 1st of 1976 in Wyoming. Um, he was the first of two sons born to Judy and Dennis Shepard. And he had a younger brother. He was very close with his brother. He was known to be friendly to all his classmates when he was in school, like in grade school. But sometimes they did pick on him because he had a very like petite um, stature, which you can kind of tell from the picture that I shared. But mm-hmm. um, and he he wasn't very athletic, so people would pick on him for that stuff. But other than that, he was a very well liked person. He really was a sociable person. Um, He was interested in politics from a young age. He traveled with his family because his father took work outside of the country. They moved to Saudi Arabia when he was like towards the end of his high school career. And mm -hmm. there he participated in theater and he also took German and Italian courses. And he was a peer counselor. Um, He got elected by all his peers to be a peer counselor because he was so easy to talk to. He made friends really easy and he actively fought for the acceptance of others. Oh my God. Um, so, right. I know not to like paint a picture for you guys, but what a. What he a was a fun. sweet baby angel. He really was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because of his passion for equality and love of travel, he ended up actually being a political science major at the university, at the university of Wyoming in Laramie with a minor in languages and foreign relations. So you can kind of see how like his whole life was leading up to where he was. Mm -hmm. And then this happened. So on the night of October 6, 1998, Matthew was approached by a man named Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson at the Fireside Lounge in Laramie. Um, they decided to give Matthew a ride home, and he was a really friendly person, so he accepted. They drove to a remote area and robbed and tortured Matthew. They tied him to a fence and left him to die. He was so he was beaten so brutally um, that his fa- when they found him, his face was completely covered in blood, except he had like little streams from where the t- tears were going down his cheek. Um, there's a lot more graphic stuff mm-hmm. to that, and that's as graphic as I'm going to go, but you can do more research if you want to find out more of what exactly they did to him. Mm-hmm. Um, so after those two boys, because they're not men, after those two boys attacked Matthew, they left him tied to the fence, um, bleeding and all beat up, in near freezing temperatures and they went back into town and then they returned a fight with two Hispanic youths um, because that's the kind of people that they are. Just the worst of the worst. Yep. Um, Police arrived on the scene of the fight and they ended up arresting them Um, and they searched McKinney's truck and they found the blood smeared gun Um, with Matthew's shoes and his credit card also in the truck so that's kind of how they knew to link it to them eventually after they found him so Matthew was in a coma for 18 hours overall tied to that fence before anyone found him and actually it was a bicyclist that found him and originally when he saw him he thought that he was a scarecrow because his body was so like limp and lifeless Mm -hmm. so 
he called the police. Um, the police came and found him alive. He was covered in blood. They brought him to the hospital. So he suffered from the following injuries. He had fractures to the back of his head and in the front of his right ear. He experienced severe brainstem damage, which affected his body's ability to regulate his heart rate, his body temperature, and other, other vital functions. And he also had, like, cuts and bruises all over his body. His injuries were deemed too severe for doctors to operate, and Matthew never regained consciousness and remained fully on life support. I know that we gave a trigger warning at the beginning, and I kind of wish I did it before this, and I'm really sorry, guys. Um, so he, yeah, he never gained consciousness. He stayed on life support. Um, while he was in the hospital, there were um, vigils all over the world for him, which is crazy. Um, yeah. He was pronounced dead six days after the attack at 12.53 a.m. on October 12th, 1998. So uh, they were, the two guys were arrested and initially charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, and aggravated robbery. After Matthew's death, the charges were upgraded from attempted murder to first degree murder, which meant that they were both eligible for the death penalty. Uh, when they were being interviewed by police, it came out that they decided to rob Matthew when they were still at the bar, and they pretended to be gay to lure him to the truck. Um, and then, allegedly, Matthew put his hand on McKinney's knee, and McKinney said it triggered him be because of how he felt about the gays, um, so he had to t attack him. So twisted. So, Very. On, in April of 1999, um, Henderson actually avoided going to trial. He took a plea deal and he, you know, testified against McKinney, who, as I understand it, was the more active one in the murder. Um, so he ended up being sentenced to two consecutive life terms. That was his plea deal. Um, so they took... Um, What's it called off the table for him? Death the death penalty. Yeah. Um, so McKinney's trial took place in fall of 1999, and they attempted to use the gay panic defense, which mm. I've used a little. I talked about it, I think, last time I did trivia, but for those that weren't on trivia or don't remember, um, the gay panic defense is something that you can legally use in court in 46 six of the states I believe still it's, today no. yes wow yep. yep um I think that's what I said last time yeah I think it's illegal in six or it's no longer able to use in six states um so all the rest of the states you can use it and you can say if you murdered someone who is homosexual or transgender you can say because there's also the trans panic defense mm -hmm. you can say oh uh, you know I freaked out and I didn't know what to do I had temporary insanity and I just went berserk and killed them um, and the sad part is um, a third of the people who use the gay panic defense get their charges lowered because of it the defense works for them that's unacceptable in 2020 that's unacceptable it's like unacceptable anytime but yes yep um so his lawyers tried to use that and say that you know he had temporary insanity due to it and the judge actually rejected it in this case and I mean being that it was in Texas I think you know, there are a lot of other cases in Texas where it did fly. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that everyone from the world, around mm -hmm. the world was watching this, maybe, I can't say for sure, but I think it put some pressure on them. Mm -hmm. um, the jury did find McKinney guilty of premeditated murder. Oh, they did not find him guilty of premeditated murder, but guilty of felony murder. 
and they did deliberate on the death penalty. However, Shepard's parents, um, they brokered a deal with them that resulted in him just receiving two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. So in the years that follow Matthew's death, his mother, Judy, has worked as an advocate for LGBTQ rights, particularly issues related to gay youth. Mm -hmm. She was the main force behind the Matthew Shepard Foundation, which is one of the places that I got a lot of information from. And her and her husband founded that in 1998. Okay, so Savannah says it has been banned in 10 states as of mm -hmm. right now, but considering that there are 50 states, that's still pretty insane. Mm -hmm. And she uh, said eight more states are fighting it, but it has not passed yet. And then do you see the, um, Ellen commented a website yeah. to go to? Yep. So LGBTQ or LGBTbar.org. It's a great resource to get information and see what they're doing to advocate for change of discriminatory and harmful laws. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Yeah. To check out. Yeah. And I don't want to cool. interrupt you, Kenzie, because I know you have more to say, but I think that it's important that when we talk about these violent cases, it's not to plaster somebody's life and murder anywhere. It's to say that this happened. I That happened when I was born and that, it happened when you were born. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen that long ago. And the fact that it's a law like that is still legal now. It's like when you go to a website like that, there are things that you can do as an ally or you can do as someone in the community to help change these things so that they can never be repeated again. And I think it's like so awesome when people can like use their voice and it's so empowering to say, we won't stand for this and we'll, we'll do something to change it. So I just want to throw that out there yeah. <laughs> just to say, not yeah. to say that we're not talking about this for no reason. Like there's actual intentional things that we can do to help. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm going to check out uh, more about those links and mm -hmm. maybe send some follow up because yeah, that's crazy. So mm -hmm. our second case um, is about James Bird Jr. Um, so definitely going to be sure I put a trigger warning on this one as well. Um, so James Bird Jr., he was not actually part of the LGBTQ community. However, his case um, did play a huge role in the Hate Crimes Prevention Act, and it's equally as worth talking about. So I left out a lot of detail in this Um when we get to what happened to him, it was extremely graphic, and it was very, I'm not going to lie, it was extremely upsetting, um, so I'm not going to go too in detail with what happened, but if anyone does want to know more, because what they did to him was absolutely horrific, um, I used the, re uh, biography.com had quite a lot of information about him, and I also um, use NPR for a source and then a little bit from Wikipedia. So, um, yes. James was a Black man born on May 2nd, 1949 in Beaumont, Texas. Um, he was the third of eight or nine children, depending on which source you look at. Um, he was raised in a very religious family. Their lives revolved around the church. His mother was a Sunday school teacher and his father was a deacon at the Baptist church. And James was very active at the church. He played piano and sang. He, this is a cool fact about him. Um, he graduated in the last segregated class in his high school's history. Wow. So I thought that. That was interesting just to see kind of like where they were when mm -hmm. he was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, so James actually did academically really well, but he decided against going to college and he ended up getting married and had three children. Um, he did struggle a little bit with alcoholism and eventually divorced his, life, his wife which led him to move to Jasper and he started going to Alcoholics Anonymous, trying to get like a fresh new look on his life mm -hmm. in Jasper. And that was in 1996 that he went there. Um, he was described 
by like everybody as a friendly father and grandfather. He was charismatic, musically talented, and generally well liked. So, in the early morning of June 7th, 1998, James left his parents' house and accepted a ride from three white men who were allegedly drunk at the time. Um, their names were Sean Barry, Lawrence Brewer, and John King. Instead of bringing him home, they drove him to a deserted area and um, they beat him and did a lot of really awful things to his body. And like I said, I'm not going to mention here what those things are, but it was horrific. Um, they ended up wrapping a chain around his ankles and they dragged him down an asphalt road for over three miles. Um, I'm going to save you more details um, about it, but parts of his body were dropped off um, in front of an African-American church. And then the three men just drove away and went to a barbecue. That's how much they cared about it. Um, Zero empathy or more than anything. Yeah. So a motorist ended up finding his remains the next morning and um, police found a wrench nearby that had fallen off of the truck and it had Barry's name on it so that they knew it was his. Um, and they also found a lighter that belonged to King and it had his, his very well-known nickname etched into it. So they kind of were quick to figure out who did it. Um, so there were a lot of things that also made it pretty obvious that it was racially motivated. Um, Brewer and King were well-known white supremacists. King was actually a member of the KKK at the time and had several racist tattoos, including one of a black man being lynched. Um, Law enforcement was quick to realize that it was a racially motivated crime, as I said. Um, And I even got the impression from doing my reading that they bragged about it around town and word spread. So... Uh, they were able to put that together. Um, All three were convicted of capital murder. Brewer was executed by the state in 2011, making him the first. Mm -hmm. That makes it the first time a white man received a death sentence for killing a black man. Wow. 2011, even though that's been happened for centuries. Wow. (laughs) That's really, really, really surprising. I can't, I didn't put if that was in Texas specifically or the United mm-hmm. States. I want to say it was in Texas, but mm-hmm. I didn't put that. So, um, and actually, um, so James, his only son, Ross, um, was anti-death penalty. And he, um, he really advocated for them not to put the men to death. Um, wow. For his own father's murder. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. I mean, that takes a lot of forgiveness, I think, to, yeah. Um, But King was executed by the state in 2019. And Barry is actually up for parole in 2038. So, um. So on May 11th, 2001, Texas Governor Rick Rick Perry signed the James Byrd Hate Crimes Act into law. And that act was to strengthen penalties for crimes motivated by a victim's race, religion, color, sex, disability, sexual preference, age, or national origin in the state of Texas. Um, After that, the Bird family started working with Matthew Shepard's family very specifically, and they started doing a lot of lobbying and whatnot, Um, and they were able to pass the Matthew Shepard and James Bird Jr. Family Crimes Prevention Act, which is a federally acknowledged um, act law that was signed in on October 28th in 2009 by President Barack Obama. So that's crazy that, um, hold on, I said that this James Bird happened in, 
Yeah, so they happened the same year. They the both same happened year, right? In, yeah. Mm-hmm. They both happened in 1998, and then mm-hmm. it took about um, a decade for them to federally do it. But, I mean, I'm glad they did because mm-hmm. no one should be treated mm-hmm. unfairly in any way based on who they were born to mm-hmm. be like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is, that is, like, so incredible, and, like, it, it's a shame that something so abhorrent has to happen for, like, these things to be passed, and I think that sometimes, like, we look around, and, like, we, we think that everything's okay, but then you hear these things, and, like, that, that just happened, you know what I mean? And it took until, it wasn't that long. Yeah, it wasn't It was in our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that it really also speaks to intersectionality, which if people aren't familiar with the term intersectionality, it's just the idea that um, it kind of the idea that social issues and let me know, Kenzie, if I'm just if I'm describing this right. It's like the idea that social issues are all related. So like we can't talk about women's issues without also including um, um, race, like upholding like um, right justice for like black people it's like everything is um intersectional and I think that's really powerful that both families were able to come together to make this happen because like you said no one deserves to face that discrimination um yeah that's just crazy so I know that those were both um you know pretty heavy um and I apologize if we were a downer in any way for your day, but it is an important part of history. Um, it's important to know how far we've come and what led to that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe we'll do more stories if anyone has any that they would like to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, we would definitely love to tell them. Mm-hmm. Um, and if anyone and is for- feeling very triggered by this or anything and you want to reach out to either of us for us to put you in touch with resources or just to talk um I think we're both willing to do that and yeah yeah Yeah. um so in a few minutes if you need a palate cleanser after that um Cheyenne is going to be doing a makeup tutorial She got challenged by um, Caitlin over in Two for Two. Um, They're doing the Pride Makeup Challenge. So she's going to show you how to do a Pride look. And I know it's very, like, common and cool to watch people do their makeup. And I personally can't wait to see what she comes up with. I think it's going to look awesome. Me too. Yeah, so definitely check that out because it – after these heavy topics, it's important to do self-care and to um, kind of go into, like, the positive side of pride and everything, too. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for listening. All right. We don't have a sign-off. I know. <laughs> well, bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>